good afternoon we are going to start uh, the lecture number 33 for uh, basics of wireless sensor networks and application this is module 4 we have started the module yesterday and uh, yesterday we had seen all the basic features of wireless sensor network the uh, position of wireless sensor network in ad hoc because we had found that ad hoc is having mainly four types of uh, networks or classification was having four categories first one was manet second one was vanet third type of network in ad hoc wireless network was uh, this wireless sensor network and fourth one was wireless mesh network which is called as wmn so we found that wireless sensor network is a part of uh, ad hoc wireless network with a uh, very special features so all the features we had seen yesterday we had seen different types of applications i had shown you that uh, a different book uh, textbook we are going to use for this uh, module number 4 as far as your syllabus is concerned textbook number 5 that is actually the writer is cordero uh, and agarwal that book you have to use uh, for this module number 4 preparation and uh, eighth chapter in that uh, book or eighth chapter in that uh, cordero book is uh, exactly aligned with your syllabus so i had shown you the syllabus i had uh, started the uh, wireless sensor network basic applications basic understanding yesterday and we had seen uh, internal block diagram of a wireless sensor node what are the different uh, subsystems are there inside uh, wireless sensor network node we had found Uh, yesterday the same uh, slide was shown during uh, lecture number 3 in module 1 okay so it's a repetition so there in module 1 i had shown it earlier but actually that part that is what are the internal subsystems of uh, wireless uh, sensor node that is actually a part of uh, module 4 so that question will be asked in module 4 and uh, then we had seen uh, what are the different application fields so if you see the book of cordero they have given some 11 or 12 different applications uh, that applications uh, i will be doing a few and you can take some of those applications as your course seminar topic uh, that was also told to you and uh, finally in yesterday's lecture i had uh, shown you uh, something about barclay mica mode on mica mode Uh, what is a mica mode mica mode is a, a very small sensor node which is developed by berkeley uh, and they are uh, deploying the sensor node for mainly temperature sensing and some two three other parameters are there we will see that in detail today so mainly temperature sensing and other thing so that mode node it's a wireless sensor node it is deployed uh, in a wide area to sense a certain uh, environmental parameter and uh, that we will see the mica mode in detail and if time permits we will see another thing uh, which is called sensing range and communication range so this also we have seen in uh, module 1 the slide is repeated here what is meant by sensing range and what is meant by communication range so in short to tell you sensing range is the range of the sensors which are fitted on the uh, mica mode node or wireless sensor network node and that senses certain parameter within a small area uh, maybe 2 meter 3 meter or something and uh, what is the communication range so after sensing the data that sense data is stored in the wireless sensor node and depending on uh, the requirement depending on the ask uh, this sensor node is going to transmit that data over a longer distance and uh, towards the base station or to the sync node so yesterday we had found that there are different uh, topologies so three four uh, we had taken the example of agriculture so in agriculture we are finding different parameters we are sensing different parameters like uh, temperature like soil moisture like uh, soil quality maybe humidity and other things so all these things are sensed by very simple uh, nodes without any kind of big computational capacity or not very strong uh, microcontrollers in it okay after all the sensor nodes so this is at lowest at the hierarchy after all this uh, local sensor nodes are sensing all the data they are just transmitting it to the nearest cluster head okay in cluster heads are some sensor nodes which are having some little bit uh, more stronger uh, microcontroller and they are having more distant uh, communication capability 
So uh, first stage of transfer, data transfer is occurring from the local sensor nodes, uh, the WSL nodes like moat and all. Uh, Mika moat is also called as moat. Okay, so from this moat, the data is transferred, uh, sense data is first transferred to the cluster head. Cluster head can do some kind of processing because the uh, cap complexity or the microcontroller capability of cluster heads are little more than this local sensor nodes. So cluster heads then do what? Cluster head then do some data fusion, data processing, and that process data is next transferred by many hops. Okay, so there are intermediate hops, there are multi-hop structure is there. Through multi-hop, uh, the data is finally transferred to the sync node or base station. So at base station, many uh, data comes from many such cluster heads. So base station do a second level or higher level data processing and a final inference is uh, drawn from the all the uh, fused data from all the cluster heads. And that final data is put on web and anybody sitting at a very far distance also can access that data, which is occurring at a very local place like a agricultural field or like a paddy field. So from a very local, very small region, the data is uh, being transferred to a very far region. Data is being put on internet. So it's a global communication happening. Uh, that is actually the job of wireless sensor network. And I told you yesterday that uh, all these advances in IoT actually is having wireless sensor network at the backbone. When this wireless sensor network concept came before 20, 25 years, at the time, people thought that uh, all the sensor nodes will be sensing and through some uh, uh, router, through some intermediate nodes, all the data will be sent to at a base station. Base station will upload the data uh, on web uh, or uh, internet like that. But nowadays, it is not like that. Nowadays, it is thought that all the local uh, uh, objects, okay, so even if a local chair table and other thing, every object will be having uh, internet connectivity. So from IPv4, they have shifted to now IPv6 and uh, too much, uh, too many addresses. We are having millions and billions of addresses and directly the devices, directly the sensors will be able to upload the data uh, directly on internet or web. So we will not have to wait for the data to be transferred to the uh, cluster head from there to uh, the base station and base station will upload. No, that uh, topology is gone. Now what we are thinking is all the sensor nodes directly will be sending, uploading the data on web. So this kind of uh, structure it has come into. So from uh, wireless sensor network, we have come to IoT now. But remember that uh, at the backbone of IoT, always uh, wireless sensor network is there. So this is a very special chapter. Uh, I'll be going for the next topic. So today's topic is Barclay Mika mode. So this is a very special wireless sensor node and what are the uh, features of that? What are the uh, specifications of that uh, Barclay Mika mode that we are going to see today? So this will be our topic, mainly the Mika mode Barclay and uh, sensing range and communication range. We already know this sensing range and communication range, but there are certain proofs uh, mathematical proofs are there for sensing range and communication range. We can see that in next lecture next week. But today we'll be able to complete the Barclay Mika mode kind of a thing. Then third topic you can find design issues and challenges of wireless sensor network, then energy consumption in WSN clustering and applications of wireless sensor network. So we have somehow touched all these topics previously. Okay, then uh, I did not tell you that again, it will be repeated in wireless sensor network. But yes, uh, in this chapter, we have to uh, do all those topics in a formal way. So let us go forward. Uh, so these are the internal blocks of uh, mode architecture. So uh, this uh, mode sensor node and one block diagram of sensor node was shown to you. Today, you are going to see exactly the same block diagram, but with uh, name of all the components used there. So yesterday, I said mi microcontroller. Today, I'm going, not going to say microcontroller. I'm going to give a specific name. Just see, yesterday I said there was a transceiver module. Okay, And in transceiver module, what you're using is TR-1000. So TR-1000 is a transit transceiver module that is used in Mika mode. Mika memory. Yesterday, I told you that block as uh, memory or storage. Today, they are saying Mika is using flash chip for data storage. And Mika is having a power subsystem. Mika is having an input output IO subsystem. 
and there is operating subsystem so that was not explained yesterday i mentioned but uh, whenever i was explaining the uh, internal block diagram of a generalized wireless sensor node i did not explain about any os but yes without os uh, wsn cannot function so this uh, barclay mica mode is having a special os which is named as tiny os okay, os is operating system uh, it will not be elaborated here tiny Okay, so these are uh, some of the blocks of uh, the Barclay-Mika mode. That is, there will be a, a microcontroller inside it. That is the heart of uh, or the brain of uh, the wireless sensor node. Then there will be a radio module, uh, which is called as TR1000. Uh, then there will be a data storage flash chip, then power subsystem, because every point of or every block of this uh, wireless sensor node has to be powered for proper function. And finally, there is an operating system. So this is actually uh, the Barclay Mika mode. So there are three, four different questions which may be asked um, from this uh, Barclay Mika mode. And they're all important question. One question is what are the internal block diagram structures? So this is the internal block diagram structure. You can see that instead of uh, the microcontroller, here I have written at mega 103, okay? So this is the name of the microcontroller. And uh, these are the uh, serial interface, this is DS20. Uh, 2401 this is a unique id this is given to this and then this is the transceiver module tr1000 so data of both directional data that is from microcontroller to transceiver and transceiver to microcontroller both directional data transfer is possible and transmission power control happens because uh, you have to control the power of the transceiver and there's the hardware accelerator uh, and there, there's the power generation unit a power regulation unit this is ic max 1678 Okay, and this is the flash memory and there's a coprocessor. This is actually sharing the burden of the actual microcontroller. And here is the 
uh, digital IO. So how many pins are there? You can check there is 51 pin IO expansion connector. So that is actually connected with the Atmega 103 microcontroller. There's a digital IO, there are eight analog IOs and there are eight programming lines. So uh, whatever block diagram we had seen yesterday, uh, that has become more specific now whenever we are doing Barclay micro mode. We cannot say simple microcontroller, but we have to say Atmega 103 microcontroller. We cannot say simple memory or storage. We have to say four megabit of external flash and uh, coprocessor. We cannot say a power regulation unit, but we have to say the name of the IC, that is MAX 1678. So these two questions are different. If I ask you internal subsystem of a, a generalized wireless node, wireless sensor node, then whatever diagram I had shown you yesterday could be drawn. But if I'm asking you the internal structure or Mika architecture, you can say here, Mika mode architecture or Mika mode architecture, then this diagram you have to draw and this specifications you have to explain. Okay, so it's saying Mika mode architecture block diagram, the direct connection between the application controlled and transceiver enables flexibility in meeting the application demands. Hardware acceleration optionally assists in communication protocol. So this hardware acceleration is actually helping uh, communication to happen in a seamless manner. But what are there inside this uh, uh, Micamote uh, hardware that we have seen in the next slide, but there's a previous slide actually, it is taken from the PDF paper of Jason L. Hill, uh, IEEE uh, Micro, IEEE Computer Society. This is a November, December 2002. I told you that all these concepts of uh, wireless sensor network, it, has, it had come around 1995 and uh, in between 2000 to 2005, huge development happened in uh, wireless sensor network. Many papers had come, uh, many hardwares were de defined, many applications uh, had come into picture. And then slowly after 2010, it evolved to IoT. So now wireless sensor network has become an integral part of IoT. So let us see what is the basic of uh, or what is the internal structure. So this website, you can please check. Okay. You will be finding all the details related to Barclay Mika mode. Uh, the Mika wireless platform, so it's a, a wireless sensor node. So this is the uh, antenna of it. And this is the uh, basic uh, IO pins. And this is a processor, whatever, Atmega 103, which was said. And uh, this wireless platform serves as a foundation for the emerging possibilities. It measures 1.25 inch by 2.25 inch. So you can just check it is a little bigger than a matchbox. Okay. Uh, but it is tremendously powerful. It runs the uh, TinyOS operating system and is suited for self-configuring multi-hop wireless network. Self-configuring means, suppose uh, routing is happening and uh, through some four or five different nodes and some node goes bad, uh, its battery gets wasted or somehow it gets burnt or something. So other nodes, what they will do is they will reroute, they will reconfigure the path so that uh, the data transfer from the source to receiver happens in a seamless fashion. That is actually the self-configuring and self-healing is also there. Okay. So this is a self-healing network or self-configuring type of network. So with sensing, communication, IO capabilities, the Mika mode can simultaneously act as a data router or sensor interface and a control uh, point. Okay, so it can be used as a sensing uh, device. So there are sensors fit on this Mika mode. So it can be used as a local sensor. Okay, and after the data is sensed, uh, after it is a little bit processed here, it can be transferred by means of a transceiver TR1000 is there uh, to the next uh, uh, routing node. Okay. So it can act as a data router or it can act as a sensor uh, interface or it can act as a uh, control point, controlling the overall communication, controlling the uh, data flow. Okay. So it can act as a router, sensor interface and control point. So it's a very smart kind of technology which is which was designed by the Barclay. So nearly 100 uh, research groups currently use Mika uh, nodes to explore the networking techniques, data analysis, distributed algorithm, uh, network devices, programming, and novel application. So they are actually talking about in the year 2002 because this paper was written in 2002 from where all these data are taken. Nowadays, the Mika has advanced a lot and not 100, but more than thousands of groups worldwide, they are using it and they are working for the betterment of this Mika nodes. 
Okay, so the work it does is uh, networking techniques it explores, data analysis, distributed algorithm, network services, programming, novel applications. All these things are done internally by the Mika mode uh, WSN node. So Mika's flexible design serves as a building block for creating efficient application specific protocol. Instead of defining a narrow standardized application interface, the Mika provides a set of rich interconnected primitives. So what are the primitives? Data serializer and timing extractor. These are very primitive circuits that are also put in Mika to facilitate the cross-layer cross optimization. So you have seen there are different OSI layers. Okay, so whatever data sensed from Mika, it uh, encompasses all the different layers of uh, the OSI layer. So it goes there. So to explore novel system approaches, researchers can develop customized protocol tailored to their application. So there, there's the openness in the uh, software that may be uh, put into this uh, Mika mode and you can customize it for your application. That facility is also there. So this line is very important to explore uh, novel system approaches. Uh, researchers can develop customized protocol tailored to their application. That means you can generate your uh, protocols and you can put it to Mika for some kind of very specific applications. That is also possible. There are a lot of nodes which are actually blocked. You cannot put any uh, external kind of uh, program into it. Okay. But Mika is not like that. Mika mode, you can put your own program, you can do your own uh, routing, you can put your own algorithm into Mika. Okay. And you have to uh, inform it to that group that these are the advancements I have done. If they find it uh, quite good, quite novel, then they will pay you for that. Okay, so that is another thing which is there for Mika mode. So Mika does not require use of predefined protocols. So not necessarily that you have to use some predefined protocols. Uh, you can uh, use your own protocol and for your own network because uh, one advantage or disadvantage, whatever you say that wireless sensor network is having, then nothing is fixed here. If you are using a, a LAN protocol or something, uh, uh, you have to abide by, you have to follow certain rules. Okay, but in case of wireless sensor network, there is nothing fixed. Everything is in the air. You can improve uh, over the existing protocols and you can give it a name with your name and you can uh, use it for your work. Okay, so that is there. So that openness is always there in case of uh, this uh, wireless sensor network and Mika node. So Mika does not require use of predefined protocol. So today I'll upload this paper of Hill. Please check this paper of Hill as well. I explained already these things. So what are the main important things you have to remember? Uh, the uh, ICs, you have to remember the uh, flash memory. What is the size? You have to remember the number of IO pins, that is 51. You have to remember this is a, a unique ID, whichever is given to the serial interface. You have to remember a coprocessor is not mentioned here, uh, but there is definitely a coprocessor for sharing the burden on the microcontroller. And many important thing is we are using Atmega 103 microcontroller here. We are using TR 1000 radio receive transceiver here. We are using Max 1678 for power regulation. And there are 51 pin uh, input output expansion connector, which is there. And there are many uh, digital lines and eight analog lines and eight programming lines. So these are the details you must produce when you are writing about uh, the internal block diagrams of uh, Mika mode. So uh, this block diagram you have to draw and you have to write about every uh, internal subsystems that what this Atmega microcontroller do, what kind of work, what this power regulation IC do, what this uh, unique serial ID do, what this IO do, and what does this transceiver do. All these things you have to explain. So this can be asked for a five to 10 marks question. Please go through the paper of Hill. Okay, in the paper of L Hill, you'll be finding all the details about the internal part of uh, the subsystems of Mika mode. Some explanation is given here, but this is not complete, but uh, some explanation, a little bit explanation, whatever fits into the uh, slides is given here. So Mika architecture block explanation. So this explanation with the previous block diagram, whichever is shown in the previous slide, will be asked in the exam. So Mika architecture, it consists of five major modules. First one is processing. That is the central microcontroller at Mika 103. RF communication, that is TR1000. 
power management power management is given by max 1678 io expansion already told you that 51 lines are there and secondary storage secondary storage is nothing but this uh, flash memory or something okay so these are the five main things there is processing communication power management io and storage device schematic and data sheet for all components mentioned can be found in the website tinyus.net so you have to search two things one is the paper of hill i will give it to you and uh, if you go to the website tinyus.net there you will be finding all the internal device details for this mega mod main microcontroller is an atmega at, atmel atmega 103l or uh, atmega 128 also is fitted with some mega modes uh, they are running with 4 megahertz uh, frequency and delivering about 4 million instructions per second so mips mips is a uh, measure of how fast or how uh, strong the microcontroller is so mips is million instruction per second so this at mega uh, 103l it can process for, with 4 megahertz frequency and can give 4 million instructions per seconds or it can solve 4 million instructions per second 8 bit it's a 8 bit microcontroller with uh, 128 kilobyte of flash program memory 4 kilobyte of static ram internal 8 channel 10 bit adc it is written here that it can take eight analog inputs that means there has to be eight channel uh, there has to be eight adcs each adc is 10 bit okay three hardware timers uh, because everything has to be properly synchronized that's why timers are required 48 general purpose io lines okay it is given already so one external uart uh, the serial peripheral uh, interface that is spi port is there only one spi port is there so normally programming this embedded microcontroller occurs during manufacturer with a firmware upload or during maintenance uh, co processor handling the wireless programming is atmel 8090 ls2343 so here also whenever you are drawing this diagram in this place of co processor you can name the co processor as atmel 8090 ls2343 which is a 8 pin flash based microcontroller with internal system clock and five general purpose io pin Maxim DS two four zero one. It's a low cost ROM device. Provide the unique user ID, unique ID for each node. So this DS two four zero one, which is nothing but a uh, low cost ROM. Okay, this device actually is pro producing the device ID because it is very important for uh, the base station to know uh, how many sensor nodes are deployed within the area of application and what are the nodes of every ID. so depending on the id and depending on the location uh, the base station will come to know that what's happening in which corner of uh, the area which is being monitored and which uh, of the uh, mega mode node is there to track all those changes in that part of the uh, network or in that part of the area okay so having a network uh, having a, a Uh, ROM device inside the wireless sensor network. It actually gives you a very unique ID, and this unique ID is really unique. That uh, no two nodes should be having same ID. Otherwise, there will be a mixing of data, and wrong information will be wrong inference will be produced uh, by the uh, position where the data fusion is taking place. Okay, so this is very important thing. Maxim DS two four zero one. It's a low cost RAM. and which is producing the unique id for every node and for every node the id is different so this was about the mainly about the microcontroller and some of the storage and uh, the io pins and other thing and uh, let us now check what is the radio module that is tr1000 so tr1000 is a very widely used module we have to uh, buy this module in pair so i had bought this module for my work somewhere around 570 rupees it was there one pair was costing at that time okay now it definitely have uh, become more costlier please check so the mika radio module consists of a rf monolithic tr1000 transceiver and a set of discrete components to operate the radio now some special features are coming software can externally set the transceiver's transmission radius so you can uh, program the transmission radius that is a very important thing so it is connected to microcontroller and there is a power control unit you can check that hardware accelerator 
this actually through microcontroller through this hardware accelerator it is giving controlling the power of tr1000 so you can uh, increase or decrease the range of uh, this whole node uh, as far as your programming so if you want to send uh, if you want to send the data for a bigger region in that case you have to increase the power of hardware accelerator if you want to decrease the uh, communication range through this hardware accelerator through this uh, atmega 103 microcontroller based programming you can increase or decrease the uh, transmission receiving power of tr1000 so it's a very important thing that software can externally set the transceiver's transmission radius to range from inches to hundreds of feet 1 inch means 1/12 of a feet so from inches that is a very small 1 inch 2 inch distance to hundreds of feet just imagine what is the capability of this ic that from very small range to very big range uh, the programmer can control its transmission range so we are not changing any hardware just by the software programming we can control the transmission power of tr1000 and we can control the transmission range of the whole uh, mega mode node a very big thing okay so from inches to the hundreds of feet and it operates at communication rates up to 115 kilobits per second this is the data rate so range of communication and data rate for every communication paradigm you should remember so it can communicate from few inches to uh, hundreds of feet that is first thing and second thing it can operate with a 115 kilobits per second data rate asc based communication is used it is having a fixed transmission frequency of 906.5 megahertz almost 1 gigahertz Okay. at maximum transmission power it outputs of, of almost 0.75 milliwatt which is quite a big power uh, for one wireless sensor node so 0.75 milliwatt is quite a big power remember that at maximum transmission power it outputs approximately 0.75 milliwatt roughly 1 by 1000 of the power of a cell phone and consumes 20 milliwatt so it transmits 0.75 milliwatt and it consumes uh, 21 milliwatt when it is in full uh, transmission range so the maximum receive sensitivity of less than 95 dbm that means that low uh, strength also can be picked up or decibels relevant to 1 mm it provides an unobstructed communication range of approximately 200 feet so just check it is written that it can have from inches to hundreds of feet so it can communicate over 200 feet uh, with ease okay no problem so in receiver mode the radio so that is actually the transmitter mode 200 feet it can transmit in the receiver mode the radio consumes 15 milliwatt so in the transmission mode it uh, gives out 21 milliwatt or it consumes 21 milliwatt in the receiver mode it consumes 15 milliwatt regardless of whether actual communication is occurring the radio interface gives direct control over the transmitted signal allowing the modulation scheme coding framing math protocol to be determined in software so all these things are happening at the background that's why even if uh, it is idle it is then also consuming some power we'll be seeing how much is the idle power and all those things uh, for this mega mode node so in addition operating system software uh, controls radio transmission strength and can sense the strength of the received signal okay that is there a uh, flash chip so here after so first we had explained uh, the uh, microcontroller module then we had explained the radio module now we are going in the uh, storage so 4 bit 4 mbit that is the 4 megabit atmel 845 db 041b serial flash chip it provides a persistent data storage okay. its interface is very smart and it has small footprints 8 pin small outline integrated circuit so these are the uh, characteristics of the ic or flash chip ic which is connected inside the uh, wsn node that is called mika mode it stores sensor data logs and temporarily holds program images received over the network interface so to hold a complete program the flash must be larger than 128 kilobyte program memory this prevented the project from considering use of the lower power electronically erasable programmable rom so it is called as eeprom okay and solutions because they are generally smaller than 
32 kilobytes. So these are some of the specifications. So what you have to mainly remember is 4 megabit Atmel 845db041b. This is the serial flash chip which provides a persistence data storage inside the uh, mica mode. Okay. Uh, power subsystem this is a very important thing and a lot of questions, short questions are asked from this. So please prepare this table very well. That is when CPU is active, it is giving. So this all column, first column is in milliwatt. And the second column is in microwatt because this first column is when the node is active. So it is said that breakdown of active and idle power consumption for Mika hardware. So what is meant by active? The node is continuously uh, transmitting or receiving power. That is called a uh, signal transmitting or receiving signal that is called as active mode and when uh, between two active modes uh, if uh, the sensor node is finding there is no packet to transmit there is nothing to listen it goes slowly into idle mode it sleeps okay because it if, if it sleeps it saves a lot of power so just see the comparison the cpu actually is, when it is active it is taking 16.5 milliwatt power but between two active sessions when the cpu goes into idle mode Okay, it is actually consuming 30 mil microwatt. So where is 16.5 milliwatt and where is 30 microwatt? Just see how many times it is uh, bigger. Okay, so as soon as it is switching from uh, idle state to active state, huge amount of power is suddenly pulled from the battery of the mega mode. So there comes a pressure on the power system as soon as the uh, node is entering from idle node to the active node. This is a very important question. At active state, 16.5 milliwatt power is used by the node. At idle state, 30 microwatt power is used by the node. It is not zero, it is 30 microwatt. For radio communication, in transmit mode, it is 21 mil milliwatt. It was given in the previous slide. Okay, so at the transmission mode, it is using 21 milliwatt. And at the receiving mode, it is using 15 milliwatt. This is when active. At uh, idle mode, it is neither doing any transmission nor doing any receiving. So that's why transmission receiving or radio power is zero when the node is in idle mode. It is idle means it is not sensing anything. It is not transmitting anything. So that's why all the transmission power receiving power are zero. The silicon ID, so whatever is the ID chip, uh, it was ROM. It is when active, it is taking 0 0.015 milliwatt power. When it is idle, it is taking zero power. External flash memory taking 45 milliwatt at active. LEDs, whatever is there on the uh, board, it is taking 10 milliwatt power when active. So external flash is taking 30 microwatt power when it is idle. And uh, whenever it is idle, there is no uh, signal from received from the uh, LEDs. So LEDs is not glowing anything. Okay, so this is zero. So only these two things are important. That is whenever the node is idle, which two things are consuming power. So when the node is idle at the time CPU is consuming power, that is 30 microwatt. When the node is idle at the time external flash is also consuming power, which is 30 microwatt. And all these are uh, active uh, power, these are in milliwatt. So let us see the power subsystem of Mika regulates the system's supply voltage, maximum 1678. It was already explained previously. There's a DC to DC converter. It provides a constant 3.3 volt supply. Okay, so this is the maximum 1678. It was shown in the uh, diagram. Maximum 1678. Max is from the company of Maxim. Okay, it is 1678. It is giving actually the 3.3 volt power, and which is boosting the uh, power of the, uh, which is giving the power to the microcontroller. So Mika operates with inexpensive alkaline batteries that provide between 3.2 volt to 2 volt. So actual supply voltage is 3.3. Uh, the alkaline batteries are providing that. Maxim chip has small form factor and high efficiency. So you should know what is form factor, test factor, ripple factor, and other things. Okay. So uh, it's having high efficiency. The converter takes input voltage as low as 1.1 volt. So always it is not working with 3.3 volt. Sometimes it is working with 1.1 volt or 3 volt also. Uh, this supplies a clean, stable voltage source for the rest of the system. So this Mika power subsystem, what is its job? Its job is to supply a clean, stable voltage to the rest of the subsystems. The input voltage significantly 
affects the TR1000 transmission strength and its receiver sensitivity. The converter chip increases the system's available power because more than 50% of the energy in an alkaline cell lies below 1.2 volt which is unusable without a boost converter. So there should be a boost converter connected with the alkaline battery. And that's why the energy in an, uh, the converter chip increases the system's available power because more than 50% of the energy in an alkaline cell lies below 1.2 volt. So there are a lot of power subsystems also uh, connected one after another. So it is not only battery, but there is a, uh, afterward there is a boost converter circuit which increases the voltage level from 1.2 volt to 3.3 volt which is also required to be connected so for ultra low power sleep mode so this is uh, you can check idle mode or sleep mode this is ultra low power the active power of 16.5 milliwatt is falling to 30 microwatt so that's why this is called as ultra low power of uh, idle mode or ultra low power of sleep mode so the ultra low power of sleep mode disabling disabling the power system lets the system run directly of the unregulated input voltage. It reduces power it consumes uh, by boost converter and microcontroller. So the radio will not operate here. You can check the radio is not operating. That's why there is no transmission power. There is no receiving power at idle state. The radio will not operate here. However, without the boost converter enabled. Uh, so boost converter is actually uh, going into sleep mode whenever the uh, node is going into idle mode. So boost converter is the main source of energy. So from source of energy it is connected and through boost converter, the 3.3 volt is being supplied to the uh, Atmega 103 microcontroller and other, other places. So if boost converter is cut off, if boost converter is disabled, at that time the whole node is automatically going into a sleep mode. So whenever we are saying uh, remote controlled switch, Okay, so RSA, remote control switch. So that uh, remote control switch is actually controlling the uh, this uh, this part. That is, what is that? Uh, there is a boost converter of the uh, uh, node. Okay, so boost converter is uh, temporarily disabled by software control. In that case, there will be no power given to the transmission. There is no power given to the receiving and the whole uh, node enters into a idle node. In idle node, it takes only 30 microwatt power and in active mode, it takes 16.5 milliwatt power. Okay. So summary of Mika's node component power consumption is given below. It is already explained to you. Uh, this is the IO subsystem. Uh, IO subsystem interface uh, consists of 51 pin uh, expansion connector uh, and that we designed to interface with a variety of sensing and programming boards. We divide the connector into the following sections. Okay, so the all 51 pins are divided into eight analog lines, eight power control line, three pulse width modulated lines. Okay, this is a PWM, two analog compare lines, four external interrupt lines. I square R bus is there from Philips semiconductor. Uh, there's a, there is one I square uh, C bus uh, from Philips semiconductor. There is a SPI bus, there is a serial port, and there's a collection of lines dedicated to programming the microcontroller. So if you add all them up, it comes to be the 60, 51 uh, IO pins or subsystems that is there in case of uh, the Mika mode. So the expansion connector can also program the device and communicate with other devices such as PC. Uh, PC can be uh, acting as a gateway or this device also can act as a gateway. Additionally, it contains a standard UART interface to control or provide data to any RS-232 protocol based device. Dozens of sensor boards with a variety of sensors have been developed that use the expansion connector. It has been used to let the Mika node control a handful of inch sized micro robotic platform. So mainly four things we have explained. First one is, uh, first one was the microcontroller uh, architecture. Second one was the radio module tier 1000. Third one was the flash chip or storage. Fourth is the power system. And fifth is the IO subsystem. So in the initial slide, if you remember, in this slide, it has said that uh, they are having actually, there are five uh, different layers, okay? So Mika is having five different layers and all these five different layers are explained through the slides. So this is the last slide we'll be seeing, we have already seen this, uh, there's something called as uh, sensing range and something called as communication range. 
So if you compare these two figures, you can find that this green circle um, is a sensing range. So within this green circle from anywhere, so this is a node, Mika mode is kept here, Mika mode node is kept here. There's a wireless sensor node, temperature sensor, humidity sensor, pollution sensor, all those things are placed on this Mika node. And they can sense data within this green circle area. So this green circle is having a radius of small a. So the small a is called as a sensing range. And capital A is equal to 2 pi r square. That is 2 pi small a square. So this capital A is the sensing range. So sensing range either can be an area. Always generally it's a circular area. Or sensing range can be given by the diameter. So either it is said as the area capital A. Or it is given by a. Uh, diameter small a anything you say it is correct but be careful whether you are mentioning the area or the diameter so be uh, clear about it so sensor node n1 is having a temperature sensor let's say it's a condition let's say n1 is having a temperature sensor uh, and there is a processor there is a transceiver unit transceiver unit is nothing but the communication unit in it so this n1 is having mainly a communication unit uh, microcontroller and some sensors and obviously battery and power unit all those things are there. temperature sensor is a non-contact type sensor so in this case non-contact type temperature sensor is used okay. the range for which the temperature sensor can sense temperature around the node n1 given by the green circle is called as sensing range of node n1 okay so we are talking about sensing range of node, but actually it is sensing range of the sensor, which is fitted to it. Okay, so this is very important that it is node sensing range is given by the uh, sensing range of the uh, sensor, which is fitted to the node. So this last line is very important. The range for which the temperature sensor or any event sensor, the range for which the temperature sensor can sense temperature around the node N1. Okay, because the temperature sensor is fitted with N1, given by the green circle around N1, like this, with a radius of small a and area of capital A, is called as sensing range of node N1. It is smaller than the communication range. Because communication range, we can increase or decrease by programming. Uh, if we want, we can control this uh, block, that is the hardware accelerator block, and it has already told you that hardware acceleration optionally assists in communication protocols that means uh, increasing or decreasing the communication power and by that increasing and decreasing the communication range of any node that is actually the job of hardware accelerator now uh, after this green uh, range after this uh, sensing range we are now thinking about communication range and communication range is given by uh, radius small b or area capital b so N2 and N3 are two transceiver nodes, so same node, N1 is there, it is transmitting, N2 is there, it is receiving, N3 is there, N2 is there, it also wants to receive, N3 is there, which also wants to receive. So one thing we can find here is uh, small b is the communication radius, small a is the sensing radius, and small b is greater than small a, which is written here that the sensing range is smaller than the communication range. And you can find here, this node N3, same node as N1. Why have I given you a notation different? Because N3 is a sensing node and N1, sorry, N3 is a receiving node and N1 is a transmitting node. What is N1 transmitting? N1 is sensing temperature data from the radius A. That temperature data within radius A is stored in uh, node N1. And after that node N1 is transmitting the sensor temperature data or sense temperature data within radius A to a different locations. Okay, so N1 is sending data to N3. Can N1 send the data to N2? Answer is no, because N1 is having a communication range of small b. It can only communicate within area capital B. And what is capital B is equal to pi into r into small b square. Okay, because we know area of a circle is given by pi r square, where r is the radius. So as the communication range is having radius of small b, this capital B or communication area <coughs> will be equal to pi into uh, small b square. That is equal to capital B. So sensor node or sender node N1 can communicate. Communicate means send or receive data both okay. uh, with other nodes within the area capital B with a radius of <coughs> small b. 
So small b is called as the communication range for node n1. Node n2 is outside the communication range because uh, n1 n2 distance is greater than small b. Hence, node n2 cannot listen any data from n1, whereas n3 is within the communication range. As n3 is within the communication range, n3 will get to listen from uh, the node n1. So whatever is the sensed data, sensed temperature data by node n1 within area A will be communicated to node n3. N3 may be a routing node and towards N3, N4, N5, the N1 data will go to the base station or sync. So N1, N3 can make a communication pair, but N1, N2 cannot make a communication pair because with this much power, with this much radius small b, uh, N1 and N3 is falling within the communication range, but N2 is falling outside the communication range of N1. Okay, so there's a sensing range and communication range. And most of the cases, we find that uh, communication range can be manipulated, communication range can be controlled uh, by a, a hardware accelerator. Okay, And generally we are finding that sensing range is less than communication range. So that's why it is given B less than A. Okay, so we'll stop here. Uh, more discussion on the sensing range and communication range and there is a small proof of that. Uh, that we will start with on the next week. And next week you'll be having your course uh, presentation. So timetable, I have already uh, designed the timetable for two batches. They will be presenting on Tuesday and the other batches I'll keep on sending the paper and I'll keep on sending the timing for them. So next week you have to finish the course presentations. So by this week, all the papers will be sent to you or your topics will be sent to you. Thank you. I stop here.